Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty One. Casting my eyes on Mr. Wemmick as we went along, to see what he was like in the light of day, I found him to be a dry man, rather short in stature, with a square wooden face, whose expression seemed to have been imperfectly chipped out with a dull-edged chisel. There were some marks in it that might have been dimples, if the material had been softer and the instrument finer, but which, as it was, were only dints. The chisel had made three or four of these attempts at embellishment over his nose, but had given them up without an effort to smooth them off. I judged him to be a bachelor from the frayed condition of his linen, and he appeared to have sustained a good many bereavements, for he wore at least four mourning rings, besides a brooch representing a lady and a weeping willow at a tomb with an urn on it. I noticed, too, that several rings and seals hung at his watch-chain, as if he were quite laden with remembrances of departed friends. He had glittering eyes, small, keen, and black, and thin, wide, mottled lips. He had had them, to the best of my belief, from forty to fifty years. "'So, you were never in London before,' said Mr. Wemmick to me. "'No,' said I. "'I was new here once,' said Mr. Wemmick. "'Ram to think of it now.' "'You are well acquainted with it now?' "'Why, yes,' said Mr. Wemmick. "'I know the moves of it.' "'Is it a very wicked place?' I asked, more for the sake of saying something than for information. "'You may get cheated, robbed, and murdered in London, but there are plenty of people anywhere who'll do that for you.' "'If there is bad blood between you and them,' said I, to soften it off a little, "'Oh, I don't know about bad blood,' returned Mr. Wemmick. "'There's not much bad blood about. They'll do it if there's anything to be got by it.' "'That makes it worse.' "'You think so?' returned Mr. Wemmick. "'Much about the same, I should say.' He wore his hat on the back of his head, and looked straight before him, walking in a self-contained way, as if there was nothing in the streets to claim his attention. His mouth was such a post-office of a mouth, that he had a mechanical appearance of smiling. We had got to the top of Hoburn Hill, before I knew that it was merely a mechanical appearance, and that he was not smiling at all. "'Do you know where Mr. Matthew Pocket lives?' I asked Mr. Wemmick. "'Yes,' said he, nodding in the direction. "'At Hammersmith, west of London.' "'Is that far?' "'Well, say, five miles.' "'Do you know him?' "'Why, you're a regular cross-examiner,' said Mr. Wemmick, looking at me with an approving air. "'Yes, I know him.' "'I know him.' There was an air of toleration or depreciation about his utterance of these words that rather depressed me, and I was still looking sideways at his block of a face, in search of any encouraging note to the text, when he said, "'Here we were, at Barnard's Inn.' My depression was not alleviated by the announcement, for I had supposed that establishment to be an hotel, kept by Mr. Barnard, to which the blue boar in our town was a mere public-house, whereas I now found Barnard to be a disembodied spirit, or a fiction, and his inn the dingiest collection of shabby buildings ever squeezed together in a rank corner as a club for tomcats. We entered this haven through a wicked gate, and were disgorged by an introductory passage into a melancholy little square that looked to me like a flat burying-ground. I thought it had the most dismal trees in it, and the most dismal sparrows, and the most dismal cats, and the most dismal houses, in number half a dozen or so, that I had ever seen. I thought the windows of the sets of chambers into which those houses were divided were in every stage of dilapidated blind and curtain, crippled flower-pot, cracked glass, dusty decay, and miserable makeshift, while to let, to let, to let, glared at me from empty rooms, as if no new wretches ever came there, and the vengeance of the soul of Barnard were being slowly appeased 
by the gradual suicide of the present occupants, and their unholy interment under the gravel. A frowsy morning of soot and smoke attired this forlorn creation of Barnard, and it had strewn ashes on its head, and was undergoing penance and humiliation as a mere dust-hole. Thus far my sense of sight, while dry rot and wet rot and all the silent rots that rot in neglected roof and cellar, rot of rat and mouse and bug and coaching stables near at hand besides, addressed themselves faintly to my sense of smell, and moaned, Try Barnard's mixture. So imperfect was this realization of the first of my great expectations, that I looked in dismay at Mr. Wemmick. Ah, said he, mistaking me, the retirement reminds you of the country. So it does me. He led me into a corner, and conducted me up a flight of stairs, which appeared to me to be slowly collapsing into sawdust, so that one of those days the upper lodgers would look out at their doors, and find themselves without the means of coming down, to a set of chambers on the top floor. Mr. Pocket Jun was painted on the door, and there was a label on the letter-box, Return shortly. "'He hardly thought you'd come so soon,' Mr. Wemmick explained. "'You don't want me any more.' "'No, thank you,' said I. "'As I keep the cash,' Mr. Wemmick observed, "'we shall most likely meet pretty often. Good day.' "'Good day.' I put out my hand, and Mr. Wemmick at first looked at it, as if he thought I wanted something. Then he looked at me, and said, correcting himself, "'Oh, to be sure, yes. You're in the habit of shaking hands.' I was rather confused, thinking it must be out of the London fashion, but said yes. "'I've got so out of it,' said Mr. Wemmick, "'except at last. Very glad, I'm sure, to make your acquaintance. Good day.' When we had shaken hands and he was gone, I opened the staircase window, and had nearly beheaded myself, for the lines had rotted away, and it came down like the guillotine. Happily, it was so quick that I had not put my head out. After this escape, I was content to take a foggy view of the inn through the windows in crusting dirt, and to stand dolefully looking out, saying to myself that London was decidedly overrated. Mr. Pocket Junior's idea of shortly was not mine for I had nearly maddened myself with looking out for half an hour, and had written my name with my finger several times in the dirt of every pane in the window, before I heard footsteps on the stairs. Gradually there rose before me the hat, head, neckcloth, waistcoat, trousers, boots, of a member of society of about my own standing. He had a paper bag under each arm, and a pottle of strawberries in one hand, and was out of breath. Ah! <sighs> "'Mr. Pip,' said he. "'Mr. Pocket,' said I. "'Dear me,' he exclaimed, "'I am extremely sorry, "'but I knew there was a coach from your part of the country at midday. "'I thought you would come by that one. "'The fact is, I have been out on your account, "'not that that is any excuse. "'For I thought, coming from the country, "'you might like a little fruit after dinner.' and I went to Covent Garden Market to get it good. For a reason that I had, I felt as if my eyes would start out of my head. I acknowledged his attention incoherently, and began to think this was a dream. "'Dear me,' said Mr. Pocket, Jr., "'this door sticks so.' As he was fast making jam of his fruit by wrestling with the door, while the paper bags were under his arms, I begged him to allow me to hold them. He relinquished them with an agreeable smile and combated with the door, as if it were a wild beast. It yielded so suddenly at last, that he staggered upon me, and I staggered back upon the opposite door, and we both laughed. But still I felt as if my eyes must start out of my head, and as if this must be a dream. "'Pray come in,' said Mr. Pocket, Jr. "'Allow me to lead the way. I'm rather bare here, but I hope you'll be able to make out tolerably well till Monday.' My father thought you would get on more agreeably through to tomorrow with me than with him, and might like to take a walk about London. I am sure I shall be very happy to show London to you. As to our table, you won't find that bad, I hope, 
for it will be supplied from our coffee-house here, and it is only right, I should add, at your expense, such being Mr. Jagger's directions. As to our lodging, it's not by any means splendid, because I have my own bread to earn, and my father hasn't anything to give me, and I shouldn't be willing to take it if he had. This is our sitting-room, just such chairs and tables and carpet and so forth, you see, as they could spare from home. You mustn't give me credit for the tablecloth and spoons and casters, because they come for you from the coffee-house. This is my little bedroom, rather musty, but Barnard's is musty. This is your bedroom. The furniture's hired for the occasion, but I trust it will answer the purpose. If you should want anything, I'll go and fetch it. The chambers are retired, and we shall be alone together, but we shan't fight, I dare say. But, dear me, I beg your pardon. You're holding the fruit all this time. Pray, let me take these bags from you. I'm quite ashamed." As I stood opposite to Mr. Pocket, Jr., delivering him the bags, one, two, I saw the starting appearance come into his own eyes that I knew to be in mine, and he said, falling back, "'Lord, bless me! You're the prowling boy!' "'And you,' said I, "'are the pale young gentleman.'" End of chapter 21